we're ready to start. We got a focus. We have an assessment tomorrow. And of course, we have those weekly because um, on the document cam, I just want to not quite get into the material yet. I'm not quite all focusing. Okay. Mm, let's do a little karma here. Who I found in the hallway today? To really learn, quit studying and take a test. And some of you are going to be teachers out in high schools or whatever, and maybe at Cornell someday. You know that my philosophy is test, 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 rather than like every three weeks or four weeks. That's too long because what if you're off on a tangent and you're really all messed up and then you won't know it until you take the test? Like, what have I been studying? So I saw this, and actually it was put up by a professor that teaches human anatomy and physiology. So it was very interesting. I told her, I took it off her bulletin board, and I said, I'm going to go make a copy of this quick. And it makes sense, right? And you have the online quizzes. You can take a quiz every day. Now the two TAs up here have some uh, skim this at least. Okay, so what are some take-home points from this thing? <laughs> So they did an experiment on um, different groups of people. One of them just read the passage and then took a test over it. One read a section and then quizzed themselves, then read a section, quizzed themselves, and then took a test over it. And then another one did like concept mapping in it. And they found that the people who stopped the middle and quizzed themselves with their over the material and thought about it critically were the ones that did the best. And then they repeated the test later. And um, so they took the same material a week later gave them the same test, and the students that um, had been quizzing themselves were the ones that were able to get the highest scores in the test. So, so they retained it? Yeah, so they retained it better. And they were also better able to even draw out the concept maps, even not practicing that. They were used to the retrieval of mm -hmm. information. So that was really interesting. Yeah. It was interesting. I mean, I haven't read yet. I, those guys read it, I saw the headline. But you, you said a key word, retrieval. Retrieval is when you are thinking about something like name the protein in the liver that is uh, helps blood retain its fluid. And you have to retrieve that, and that's albumin. And so practice retrieval. And because that's what you're doing on exam, isn't it? You're retrieving stuff. So if you practice retrieval, then you're more likely to do well when you have to have the game day or whatever you want to call it, the exam. Who took the organic exam last night? Anybody in this room? One, two, three, four. How was it? It wasn't bad. Wasn't bad? Some other people like one. Because I, I, one of my classes yesterday, there were a couple of people really burning, studying, and I went by, by them and I go, oh gosh, that looks boring. <laughs> there was nothing about animals at all on the pages. They <laughs> so anyway, we're moving on. We're still on uh, gastrointestinal track. And uh, Sarah reminded me about showing you guys uh, the dental pad, if you're not familiar with that. And so, you know, Google is, you know, my textbook, right? The images. Does anybody here, not the TAs, but anybody in the audience know how I could for sure find an image of a bull or a cow showing me their dental pad. Because I mean that would be kind of hard because most pictures of cattle, you know, they're eating, their side view, their back view, whatever. But there's a key to search for this that, now I guess you could say dental pad, but I didn't search dental pad because then you'd have to maybe put cow, we could do that. But what's the physiological expression that animals have that they show you their dental pad? Oh, okay. You were just stretching your arm. Hmm? The Fleming response. Write that down. F L E H M E N. Capital F. And sometimes they say Flamen response. I'm not sure of the right pronunciation. F L E H M E N response. Two words. And it was like a treasure trove. And I even blew up some pictures. It's like I could. There's a horse I'll show you too to show you that they don't have a dental pad. Okay, so that's what I did. Let me go to that image. Uh, right here, the flame in response. 
And can t somebody tell me what's the, f remember this is physiology and some anatomy, what's the function then of the Fleming response, the Flamin response? Why do they do this? Let's see if anybody else knows. Um, you're on the right track, but it's not to smell better. It's you're close. You're in the right ballpark. Take in pheromones. P h e r o m o n e s. It facilitates the uptake of pheromones into the accessory olfactory structures. And these are separate structures. I mean, like when you smell bacon. That's your main, and I made somebody hungry, I bet. That's your main olfactory system. But the pheromones are scents made by one animal that can be detected by another animal of the same species. It's supposed to be very species specific. So the flame and response is a way that these animals, like this, I'll, I've got some enlarged ones, but they extend their neck and their upper lip is like everted, and that draws in air into these cigar-shaped structures that sense pheromones. How many have ever seen an animal do that? Okay, so maybe three quarters of you. Okay, so let me show you the dental pad of a bull. Let's see, which one is it? No, that's the guy. I'm gonna come back. Look at that. Are you pretty well convinced that he has no upper incisors? See the pad? <coughs> And remember, I think yesterday the discussion was cattle, sheep, and goats. And so no, no upper incisors. So that was where the dental formula of the sheep was zero, zero. It started off, right? Zero, zero. Okay. So I think I got convinced you that that's there. And I want to, I want to come back to that one. Here's a sheep. I mean, look at he can't even see anyway with those horns there. I don't know what he's doing. But that's the dental pad. And then the horse has teeth. And he could use a little floss. He's been eating grass. So anyway, that's horses don't have a dental pad. They have we didn't uh, show their formula. And then when I was searching up here, I found a neat little website at Colorado. This actually happens to be somebody I correspond with um, via email. And he has some nice pictures of the upper and lower arcade. Because I'm not sure if I used that term yesterday. I did, but arcade, A R C A D E. That's the you know the string of teeth. And when you do the dental formula, remember you start at the midline and then you go around one side or the other. And the upper arcade has a different formula sometimes than the lower one. So, and dog was dog was one of the. Uh, animals yesterday I said to learn, right? Dog and sheep. So that's one thing you should know. Whenever you look up dental formulas, they're usually talking about the permanent teeth. I remember yesterday we said the dog has 42 teeth. Why does this say 21 when I'm saying 42? Remember this is only half. Half way around on the top, halfway around on the bottom. So if you ever want to know the total number of teeth, you take the left side or right side, they're all the same, and then double it. So dogs have 42 permanent teeth. And look at that, they have 28 deciduous teeth. That's the teeth that will fall off. And this is a pretty good article because it talks about when the teeth that you rubbed, and then it gave some nice little anatomy. And it shows how, you know, the incisors, Right, you know, here's the midline, so you go around this way. Three, one, three more, that's what gives you four, and then two more. Anyway. Okay, anybody have any questions on that before we move on to something else digestive? Pretty nice set of uh, images there. Okay, so then what I want to do today is not talk about uh, normal things. Yesterday, and a lot of the videos showed normal, I want to talk about abnormal. So I want to talk about canine bloat and bovine bloat because they're different. They're similar, but they're different. And you know, some people, when you say, oh, the cow bloated, they understand that. But some people don't even know that dogs can get bloat. I've had people 
think that, you know, if I said, oh, the dog had bloat, and they said, well, what do you mean? Because only cows get bloat, and that's not true, right? So let's do the cow bloat first. <clears throat> and you gotta know your anatomy because you know the rumen in a big cow can hold 50 gallons total, something like that. So there's, remember how we talk about dairy cattle are the best ruminant around? Well, if the, there's always gas being made, right? Remember there's always acid being made? Metabolism generates acid. So then, if for some reason the animal, the cow, cannot get rid of this gas, then it stays in the rumen and keeps swelling. And I had the unfortunate circumstance on the farm years ago coming upon a cow that had died of bloat. And I mean, it was fresh as could be. And what happens is the rumen keeps expanding with gas to the point where the cow cannot breathe because it will press up against the diaphragm and stop breathing. It'll be just so tight. And I'll, I'll never forget that like it was a cow. She was dead. I mean, she was maybe half hour at the most. And she had rolled over on her side and all four legs weren't quite perfect up. They were like this. And I could not believe how tight her body was, how, how tight her skin was. If I would have had drumsticks, I could have played a tune on her ventral side. I mean, it was just full. The poor, you know, cow had to suffer there shortly. So then, um, that's blow for cattle. It presses up against the diaphragm, and they die of asphyxiation. And that's not why dogs die of blow. Usually, so okay. So the rumen, you know, is the first chamber, or you know, relatively speaking, the first chamber of the rumen. Kind of dangerous to have bloat. Does anybody know if like, you're in the middle of Nebraska where I used to live and you see a cow bloating but she's still standing and you have to do something quickly? Does anybody know what you can do to a cow that's bloating? Trocar, T-R-O-C-A-R, Trocar. Um, let me do the document cam for one second. Because this is a neat little device and Trocar is a general term see there, there it is right there, trocar, T-R-O-C-A-R. And I'm gonna go back to the my textbook Google and I'm gonna show you a picture of it. But a trocar usually is some sharp pointed shaft that fits within a sleeve. And you insert it into some structure and then you pull out the inner shaft and you've got a <coughs> passageway. Okay. So then I would say, let me just do cattle trocar. And then we'll do the images. Okay, so now let's see if I enlarge this one a little bit. Okay, so now this is very sharp. And this center shaft, the reason I'm saying it's centered, when you insert it into the animal, it fits into the sleeve first. So imagine this going down the center, and this point, see how it's, this point would be sticking out, and then this would be butted up against there. <coughs> and then what side of the animal, or the cow that's bloating, would you insert this at? Left. And do you know exactly the anatomical location? You would put it in the left paralumbar fossa. I'm going to write that down. Para lumbar fossa because it's a good anatomy lesson. So you have this trocar. You insert it into the left para lumbar fossa as you're standing on the right side because she'll kick to the left when that is inserted. So there it is left para lumbar fossa. Okay, the left side of the animal, because you should know that the rumen occupies the left side of the abdominal cavity. Paralumbar, beside the lumbar vertebra, right? Fossa is a depression in a body part or structure. So you insert that cannula, and I'm going to go back, and I'll show you the left paralumbar fossa, because it's a very distinct anatomical but that's a trocar, and you can use it for all kinds of things. 
When we did laparoscopic surgery in swine in Nebraska, we would put a laparoscope in with a trocar. We would do that, pull out the center part, and then we would put the laparoscope down the center. Okay, so then let me do the left paralumbar fossa just so you see that. Cattle left para, nobody searches that, huh? Paralumbar. <coughs> Okay, and images, and okay, let's see. I guess this one's pretty good here. Okay, you can tell this is the left side of the animal, right? Because this is cranial, that's caudal. And they've actually got an outline. It's after the last rib, and sometimes triangular, but it's always depressed, usually. And that's fossa. So you insert the um, trocar there. What might they be doing? They might be taking out some room and fluid because some cattle are what's called chronic bloaters. If you have a chronic bloater, what do you have? You like you put a trocar in there and sometimes just let the room and fluid ooze out of that hole all the time. Anyway, what else goes in that spot? What's that? A room and cannula. If you've ever seen uh, the cap-like structure up here. You can go in and insert your hand into the rumen and get rumen fluid, rumen uh, microbes, so forth and so on. Okay, so that's cave, uh, that's a bovine blow. Question. So for the trocar, can anybody like put it in, or do you have a vet do it? Oh well, if you're out in the middle of Nebraska, you do, you, you do it. But I mean, does the center part stay? Yeah, 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 sorry, yeah, the center part stays in. You put that whole device in there, and then you hold that the, the outside sleeve. And then the center part with the point comes out, and then you're, you've got a passageway. Well, I mean, you're, there, you're doing this for emergency. Usually bloat is acute, so they ate some uh, very frothy making alfalfa. You wouldn't leave in there forever, except the chronic bloaters, I've seen a cow walking around in a feedlot, with rumen fluid dripping out because she's good. If you sew it up, she'll die. You don't want to keep those animals around. But that kind of shows you that. But yeah, you have to leave that one part in, that sleeve. Okay, so. Okay, so now we'll go to canine blow. Yeah, so this is the part that's left in. You put it together, boom, and then pull out that pointed area and you've got that left. Well, right, because it bloat, remember, then that fossa becomes like almost the opposite. And so if you point it kind of in a cranial direction. Yeah? That doesn't like the inner lining of the stomach can feel of that if you take the cannula out? Uh, well, you'll have to probably maybe go in there and sew it up. I mean, this is like an emergency. Uh, okay. so this, is, this is an emergency. You're out in the middle of any place. So how does it Right, right, yeah. The, not their stomach expand, the rumen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, they'll come up. It depends. You know, remember, blow, most, like most biology, could be slight blow, a little more, a little more, a little more. Tremendous blow. Okay, so now let's talk about canine blow. I'm going to go reset my camera so I don't lose my file here. So, you know, canine blow, Dogs don't have rumens, right? So there's, it's not the same thing. It's the stomach expanding with gas. And I know there's a video and there's some, one of the reading clicks was on uh, canine bloat. So I'll just do a quick summary and get on to something else abnormal. Um, the stomach expands with gas and then it twists. The cow does not twist at all. The cow just expands, expands, expands. But the stomach in the dog tends to twist, okay? And then that's going to stop the blood flow uh, from going around the body, right? So then you're going to have uh, probably, in the extreme case, death because of a lack of blood circulation, okay? So it's quite different. And uh, in this case, 
though, now don't try this, but in a case of an emergency, you could use a trocar and a dog. Because if you could alleviate that gas, you could maybe save the animal. But if you're close enough to a vet clinic, what you do is you call ahead and say, you know, so and so is coming with a dog with blow it, and then they'll get ready for you. But here's one example. Years ago, there was a vet down at the vet school, Dr. Glickman. He and I still email because you know I email these people. He's I'm going to say the world expert in bloat. And the one uh, article that you read that has um, the dog bloat, there's an article, right? I think it's at Merck Vet Manual. If you look at down at the references, you'll see Glickman's name in some of the references. So I had emailed him about learning about bloat, and he had this exam. He told me this while he was still here. He's gone. He's in some medical school in out west or east someplace. Anyway, some lady had called him up and said, my dog's bloating. Um, and I don't know what to do, and I can't get to the vet. I don't know how close she was. <coughs> but over the phone, he instructed her how to put a trocar into the, the stomach <coughs> of the dog. But you had to improvise. Who's got a trocar in their kitchen drawer? Not many people. Do you know what I told her to use? Now, don't remember. I'm just relaying this story. A big pen that you take the center part out and cut the area with a knife and stick that big pin, just the outer case, into the stomach and let the gas escape. And he told me this when I was visiting Donna's office and the dog lived. For some reason, she was too far away, you know, so she jabbed a knife into the, the, inflate, the uh, enlarged area via his directions on the phone and then put the big pin that had the ink out, right? You, just that shaft and save the dog, okay? So that's bloat, it's deadly. I know of uh, a friend's dog died of bloat. There's a lot of theories and Dr. Glickman told me he could never get any grants to study bloat. Because no, like Karina, why would they want to study bloat? There's no money into it for them. So he had never got, he did a lot of, you know, he had like people volunteer and then, you know, watch Great Danes and all that. Anybody ever have a dog or something that, I mean, a dog that bloated or a neighbor? Can, can you tell me what the circumstance? Um, I worked in a dog kennel and we had an older Samoyed and I think it just ate too quickly and it uh, died of the night. Oh, died overnight. Yeah. So then it was being fed ad libitum. I mean, the food was there all the time. No, oh. um, we fed in the morning and at night. You fed at night and then you left? Yeah. Okay. So there's a problem there. Maybe. Yeah. Well, Should um, feed when you're going to leave. After that happened, we started, um, I mean, it was an older dog anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it was still precious. Yeah, like the owners were like not, like they were expecting it to happen. Okay. Um, but uh, we put more water in the food and we spent it. Oh, that, you're saying that decreases? Yeah, it decreases. Yeah, there's a lot of myths out there. Uh, some people say elevated dog bowls help prevent bloat. Do you know what Dr. Glickman, Glickman says? That's not true. He said that might even promote bloat. Yeah, somebody else had an experience with bloat. Yeah, we our first, we raised Great Danes and our okay. first Great Dane, we had no idea what like what we were doing. My mom's a bad tag, so we were really used to like bloating Great Danes necessarily because this was our first one. Uh, we took it to 27 different vets, and they still couldn't figure out what was causing her bloat. No, did you say 27? 27, yeah. <coughs> they couldn't figure out what was causing the bloat. Okay. Ended up uh, talking to a vet in NC State. He said, try uh, <coughs> packing her stomach to the body wall. Yeah. And uh, we did that, and she bloat, but she didn't want to die. I mean, like, she wanted to get, like, now, so now you brought it up. What do you? What's the term when you tack a stomach to the body wall? Gastropexy. Gastropexy. That's all one word. G a s t r o p e x y. Gastropexy. Twenty seven. Boy, you guys were. Yeah, it was like ten thousand dollars. Oh my yeah. gosh! Yeah, for I, sure. Was, was yeah. Like, now Great Dane yeah. probably is the number one breed, maybe. Yeah, it's like we always like felt because we breed them. We said yeah. yeah you 
And then in one of my other classes, we were talking about it. They tend to attack more females than males. But does anybody know why? I think this is what I learned at the hospital that I worked at. But usually when they're spaying a female, they'll just go in a little bit more invasive and attack the stomach wall. So when they're already in the abdominal cavity for the female with the Great Dane, they'll go, hey, it won't take much longer to go attack that stomach to the body wall. Whereas you wouldn't do that in the male because when you neuter the male, you're not in the body cavity. So yeah, if you look at all the Great Danes, the females tend to have more gastropexy. Preventative, you could call it prophylactic gastropexy. But you can do it after the fact, too, if the animal lives and prevent, yeah. So very interesting. But it's the twisting. Filling with gas and then twisting. But, uh, you know, but I know the guy that's, I'm gonna say that the best in the world so if I ever have a question from a class, I email him, although he's not at Purdue anymore, but he's still very, you know, we're still buddies in a sense. Yeah. I'm just curious why um, elevating the bulls is like a myth. Well, now the whole thing is, it's very complicated, but I think the kibble contributes to bloat. Now remember, I don't feed kibble anymore. I make my own dog food. I think when you make your own dog food, there's not that expansion and gas release. And so the kibble, they tend to eat it fast. I think it swells, makes some gas, and then the stomach might twist. I don't think that could ever happen with the chicken, the cooked chicken I feed, or the chicken gizzards, or the chicken hearts, or the sardine <coughs> the tomato sauce. I don't think that'll ever happen. I think it's more likely with kibble. But no, Glickman, I remember asking him, about it. he said, the elevated bowl, uh-uh, don't. Now what some people do is they put some obstruction in the bowl, when you feed kibble, like put a rock or something, and they have to eat around it, or don't feed them so much at one time. Feed them three times a day, or four times a day, smaller amounts. Because it's all that, the big amount of kibble at one time. You're setting yourself up for a fall. For horse colic, uh, do stomachs uh, twist too? No, no. Horse colic is always back where the uh, cecum and the large intestine is, usually. <coughs> yeah. So good question. Dogs with the mega esophagus are more at risk of a bloat because you're supposed to elevate their food dishes, right? Okay. So are you asking me or telling me? Asking. Okay. Like, yeah. like, I'm so sorry. you're saying, do dogs with mega esophagus, are, they tend to be more prone to bloat? Yeah. Okay, so here's the deal. Remember, we talked about mega esophagus, I think, one time. That's where the um, esophagus is enlarged. Usually, if you, if you ever dissect a dog and like cut the neck in the transverse section, the esophagus is always closed, and the trachea is always open. But in mega esophagus, the muscles are kind of too relaxed. So you have this big, relatively speaking, big tube. And it's hard for those guys to eat. So do you know what the chair is that they use? There's a Bailey chair, B-A-I-L-E-Y. You use a Bailey chair. And what that does, it sets the dog up on its hind legs. And they're up, and they're usually their legs are on support. Because they have trouble swallowing because peristalsis doesn't occur easily in that mega esophagus. So there they set them up, but then you would feed them multiple times. So I don't think dogs with mega esophagus have more bloat if you feed them right. Now if you just feed them once a day and pile it in there, yes. But then you never know about maybe the gas can escape easier if they have mega esophagus. See the deal there? So I don't know. You like feed them all time a day and then eat only what food you can't feed them kibble. They like eat like basically they eat like a milkshake mixture. Oh, and you're talking about the, the omega esophagus. Say it again now. They eat a milkshake mixture pretty much. So okay. They don't eat kibble. Okay. Okay, so they feed them a, a milkshake type mixture because what would kibble do? Um, something about like, kibble gets like stuck and it clogs more. Okay. So they feed in small shape, like small infants, and they feed in really soft material. A soft material. Now. Okay. So they tend not to feed kibble. Yeah, if you, oh, on YouTube, there's all kinds of uh, Bailey chair 
people. I mean, it's really quite amazing how the dogs get trained in. I saw even one that the dog jumps into the chair backwards and then with its nose flips over the tray. So it's like all ready. It was just, maybe tomorrow I can show you that or something. But yeah, good example. Good, good point, yeah. So they cannot defeat kibble to those dogs. Okay, I think we did bloat, canine bloat, bovine bloat. Now I want to do go to LDAs and RDAs. That's capital letters, LDA, RDA. We're still on digestive pathology, I guess you'd say. Uh, so what's an LDA? Left displaced abomasa. And then an R in front. DA is a right displaced abomasum, but the left tends to be more, occur more frequently. And so whenever you talk about left and right for animals, here's one way to, to you know, because sometimes you might be confused, should I be facing the animal and look at that, my left or their left? Always be behind the animal and be facing the same way, so then your left is their left, your right is their right. So what I'm saying is, in cattle, the abomasum was the true stomach, we said that yesterday, and if it twists to the right, and it's in the low part of the abdominal cavity, uh, sorry, twists to the left, my hand's going left, then that's called an LDA. If it twists to the right, it's an RDA. And that's a problem, again, because if you twist the stomach, then you're gonna be um, interfering with the digestive flow plus blood flow. It's probably not as acute, it's not as acute as bloat. Uh, bovine blow. So you could say, oh, this cow's got LDA, maybe let's see if it rights itself. But the point is, it's a digestive uh, disorder, it's abnormal, it shouldn't flip to the left, shouldn't flip to the right, and if you have to, you can do a gastropexy again. So that's very, that's a common thing. Okay, so gastropexy for displaced abomasums gastropexy for canine bloat. You never do a gastropexy for bovine bloat because there's really no twisting that occurs. Okay? Isn't gastropexy more of a treatment for the LDA? Oh yeah, well it's a treatment. Yeah, you would never, see for cattle, you would never do like the Great Dates. You would never go, oh, I, the cow is going to go LDA so I'm going to attack it. That's always a treatment. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. For, for dogs, it's either a pre, I mean, a preventative or a treatment, but cattle, you never would go in and do that. Okay? So that's another quirk, is the LDA, RDA. Any questions on that? Always kind of a problem, and there's certain ways to diagnose that. If you ever go to some place, you can uh, learn about that. Okay, so now, the other one, other thing I want to do is maybe talk about Exocrine pancreatic insufficiency in dogs. And I think I think it's mentioned in the videos. But it brings up the point, remember the pancreas can be exocrine function or endocrine function, right? So exocrine pancreatic insufficiency in dogs. See how it came up? Oh, and there's some incredible pictures. And hopefully I can run into one in just a little bit. So here's the kicker with this one. The pancreas doesn't make enough enzymes to digest the food in these dogs. And that's a problem then because remember yesterday we said macromolecules have to go to monomers to be absorbed as nutrients. So then if the dog isn't making enough enzymes that digest all the different nutrients, then they're going to stay in the lumen and pass out in the feces. So the dog might eat a lot, but will look like you're starving it. And the neighbor will call the police and say they're, they're uh, mistreating the animal because it's not being fed. It is being fed, it's just got pancreatic, exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. So it's a lack of digestive enzymes in dogs. But I think let's do the dramatic pictures. I think that would be fun. Okay, this one I've seen before. So you might say, this dog is being underfed, malnutrition, whatever. No, it's got exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. And the treatment then is, 
to give them the enzymes in their food because all these enzymes are available. And it's dramatic. I'm not sure if I can find the after picture of this dog, but he became very normal after they found out. Now again, it's like in biology, maybe the pancreas is just a little short of doing the right amount of enzymes, or maybe a little more short, or a lot short. This is a lot short. But maybe you have a dog that has trouble keeping weight on, but maybe, maybe it is just they're making enzymes, but not enough. Yeah, that's a good question. Is it inherited or not? Does anybody know? Because I do not know. I can see both components. I can see where if you're if it's genetic and they're born with it, that's congenital, right? So this is a good good lesson too in words. It could be congenital. It's going to happen. But what happens if something some the dog gets into some poison or has some virus in the pancreas and messes up the pancreas? In general, what would you call that condition? If it's if it's born with it, it's a congenital condition. If it's something that happens after birth because of some environment or something, what in general would you call that? Acquired. A C Q U I R D. It's an acquired condition. Maybe disease, maybe poison. But and so but I don't know. I don't know if let's say I had hundred cases like this. How many would be genetic? How many would be acquired? I don't think I've ever seen it. I don't know. Anybody know? Anybody ever had a dog like this? With this? Okay, good. And it, who knows, maybe there's certain breeds that are more prone. If there's certain breeds that are more prone, then you might think it might be genetic, right? The genes are doing it. That's my story. You got a quick question? Opposite, the opposite. There's too many enzymes. Well, good, oh, like, uh, there's never too many enzymes. Okay, so I won't do that. Yeah. Okay, see you tomorrow at Math 175 for our assessment. Because the sheet says you should keep testing, basically, right?